Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm thrilled to be with you today. And um, we've got another special guest for the Shifts to Success podcast. He's a client and friend. His name is Jamie Sargent. He's an ex-police officer as well, which is amazing. And uh, he is now the founder of a great company called Building Profits. Jamie is essentially a sales expert. And I thought it'd be a great uh, addition to the podcast, not only share about Jamie's story of being a police officer to now an entrepreneur, but also give his expertise on sales. I think a lot of people have got the, uh, sometimes the wrong end of the stick when it comes to sales. I think it's this kind of um, like this horrible, cringy thing. So Jamie's going to share with you his um, his ways. He's going to share with you his thinking behind it. And hopefully you get so much value that you're going to feel comfortable with sales going forward. So Jamie, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, really good. Yourself? Good stuff. Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. So one of the first questions that I love to ask everyone is, what was Jamie like as a kid? You know, where are you from? What was it like growing up for you? Uh, what was you like at school, etc.? Great. So I uh, grew up in Birmingham, North Birmingham, on a council estate. Um, I was an early child, uh, two parents that worked very, very hard. You know, dad was a lorry driver, um, drove nights. Uh, my mother was in catering, so she originally worked for NatWest, then she went to uh, West Cliffs Police in the canteen there. Worked very hard. Um, I was not overly academic at school. I turned up every day. It just, uh, some of it went in, some of it didn't. Um, but, you know, I, as a child, it was really good. You know, I was, I was fortunate to get a lot of stuff because I was the only one, I suppose, to some degree. Um, you know, family holidays uh, in the summer. Um, so yeah, it was really, really good. You know, that was good times. Um, and then, yeah. Awesome. And was you kind of a mischievous, like at school? Was you like, did you, was you like selling sweets or anything like that as you was growing up or? Uh, no, I did start an eBay business when I was, I think it was about 13, maybe 14. Um, <laughs> and so I was going to car boot sales and just buying boxes of anything really, and just whacking it on eBay and, and selling it for like a couple of quid here, a couple of quid there. Um, and, and that's kind of like my first, I suppose, like taste of doing my own thing a little bit. Mm. Um, and I kind of liked it because it was easy. It was like, you know, I'd go out and go, oh, you know, that looks great. Uh, so every Sunday morning, I'd make my parents take me to the car boot sale. <laughs> Not most kids are joyous, but I, I enjoyed it. And then buy like, you know, toys, Star Wars, whatever it was at that point. Uh, and then whack it all back on eBay. And uh, obviously eBay at that point was much slower. Uh, yeah, it wasn't yeah. of the technology of Apple iPhones and stuff. So it was camera, download and, and take forever to do it. But yeah, that was my, kind of my start into, I suppose, sales to some degree. Great. Awesome. And so what kind of like, obviously you're from Birmingham. Um, yep. you know, we've got no siblings or anything. Humble beginnings from, a, uh, I think you said council estate. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. And, and what kind of jobs did you have, you know, go, growing up? What was kind of your first job as a teenager? Uh, so I stayed, I was... Uh, my parents wanted me to go through education as much as possible because my dad never, uh, he'd left school at 14 and gone to work for the same company for like until he retired. Uh, so they were very keen on me staying in at school to at least 16 uh, and such. So I didn't do anything uh, really other than this little eBay business till I was 16. Uh, kind of got to 16 and went, I don't, don't want to sit in college. I don't want to, I don't want to sit in another classroom. Uh, I'd, I'd been attracted to the police for a long time because of the bill, unfortunately. Yeah, because uh, of the bill. Yeah, because of the bill. I so said that was that was kind of my attraction to the police. <laughs> um, and I'd done work experience with uh, NatWest Bank in Birmingham at the Mortgage Centre. Mm -hmm. uh, so left left school, uh, kind of finished there on the Friday. On the Monday, I started at NatWest um, in their originally in their IT department, helping out, bit of admin, bit of um, paperwork shuffling and such mm -hmm. uh i stayed well i'll say that I stayed that i then went on to uh, 17 and a half went on to their telephone mortgage sales so they had a two-tier system basically had your initial call and then you had like your mortgage processor almost uh but i because of my age i wasn't allowed to go on to mortgage processing mm -hmm. i was allowed to do the initial call now to do like the, the initial sale if you like get them to what's now known as an agreement in principle uh and then it'd have to go off to uh, a mortgage advisor to then take him through the rest of the way, mm -hmm. credit checks, etc. Um, and that was telephone based. It was uh, that was probably my first. Well, I was my first job really. I class it. The IT was a bit of, if I'm honest, just toss around a little bit to yeah. press some buttons and shuffle some paperwork and get paid for the privilege. 
Uh, but yeah, went on to that, enjoyed it, uh, liked it. Um, at 18, I went on to then to the mortgage sales team. So I was able to go from basically from start to finish uh, of the application all the way to, I want to say to finish, that's till it gets to the point where mortgage has been agreed and they'd go off to another department and they'd sort all the admin side of application out, you know, all the credit checks, uh, sorry, all the background checks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and at 18, I was like, right, I'm 18 now, I want to get in the police. Uh, oh. And that was like, what, why, why was that? Was that due to your mum working where she was or what was it about it? So growing up, I'd seen a lot of police around, mm. um, obviously West Midlands mainly. Uh, and it, it was kind of, I suppose I look at it now and go, I was almost in the fine line of going one way or the other because of the estate I grew up on. Mm. It's kind of you were one side of the fence or the other. Mm. Um, and then I'd had some experiences with police at secondary school, not not me personally, I should add, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, uh, you know, there'd been incidents and they'd come in and talk uh, and yeah. whatnot. And then I'd obviously also the bill had got into my mind. I was watching like, you know, Tony Stamp racing around in traffic cars and <laughs> yeah. loving life. And I was like, Right, okay. And then because my mum worked at Tally Ho, I'd occasionally, because I worked in Birmingham, I'd go meet her after work to get a lift mm. over with my dad, who'd pick her and me up. I sort of got talking to like different cops down at Tally Ho and, you know, asking them questions and standing the job and understanding it's not all rising around with blue lights on and driving mm. like a fool and, and whatnot. Yeah. There's actually some serious stuff you have to do as well. Yeah. Um, but that kind of just, I suppose it almost like drove me on a little bit to like, this, mm. you know, it's not classroom based it's not admin full-time little did i know later it was going to be admin full-time but <laughs> at that point i was like uh this is like this is the best job it's you know you get to drive around fast cars you get to lock up bad guys yeah it's a bit of admin you get to be a little bit of a like a hero for the moment yeah um so at 18 years of age like right bam application i was 18 years of one day and i'd got my application into wow um so originally I went to West Midlands because that's yeah. where I'd got all the experience. Uh, West Midlands police came back and sort of said, look, you, you know, you're too young. You've not got enough life experience. Mm -hmm. um, what about the specials? So I, I started the specials application. Um, undetermined though, I saw Staffordshire police were recruiting at mm -hmm. the same time. And it was at the times where you could basically chuck applications pretty much. I know you can't now, but you could then. Yeah. So I just put it in staffs on the off chance. Um, Got through the specials, and then as, as I was about to start the specials, also we've got the assessment centre staffs. Wow, okay. Um, so kind of went to that and said to the specials, look, you know, I've just got some stuff going on here. Mm. Um, got all the way through, uh, interviewed, and then they said at the interview stage, it was it was a bit touch and go, if I'm honest. I sat in that interview and thought, they're going to come back with the same sort of, you're too young, life experience, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I kind of almost went back to specials and said, look, I'm ready to go now, but I've got two weeks in America first. Uh, so I'm in America, and then I get a phone call saying, basically, you've got a start date with staffs. Oh, wow. 18 <laughs> years old, becoming a police officer. So, yeah, so I joined, I actually joined in November 2002. So I just, just got over 19 in August. Wow. Okay. Still very, very, very young. Yeah, it was... It was, I, 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 I only think that what favoured me is in the staff interview that I didn't do in the West Mids interview, mm. I was a bit more prepped for the staff one because I'd done the West Mids one already. Got you. Um, so I was kind of like, you know, I've spoke to these officers. I've spoke, I understand, you know, it's not all racing around. I understand that I don't have all this life experience, but here's what I can provide you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so 19, uh, November 2002, there I was uh, with a full head of hair. <laughs> like, yeah. well, that's one of the last days I had it, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm there, uh, like ready to ready to go. And uh, so I went to Brighton and Dunsmore, which was back then it was Coventry uh, mm -hmm. for training, and uh, that was the start of my policing career. Amazing, amazing stuff. So, kind of what kind of things did you do in the police? I mean, first of all, how long was you in the police for? Uh, so I was in till 2015, so about 14 years, just 14 under. years. Okay. And what kind of things did you do in those 14 years? Were you response? Did you, were you detective? Uh, uh, so I went response, uh, did the first seven years of my career on response with staffs. I then went on to a neighborhood team. Um, and if I'm honest, I was a bit sideswiped by an inspector and he said, you know, it's a brilliant job, get a neighborhood. Um, and for me, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't what I wanted it to be. Uh, it's probably the nice way of putting it. Yeah. Uh, and they wouldn't put me back on response. So I said, right, I'm off then. I'm going to the West Mids. Yeah. So I transferred across to um, 
what was Vice Street, which is Birmingham City Centre, Steelhouse Lane. Uh, so I went there for a year. Um, and, and I had the greatest time in Birmingham City Centre, but I could see it was a much, much, much busier place than what I'd been used to in staffs. Um, and I just couldn't settle properly, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to see one of my old chief inspectors, who was an inspector when I left. He was now a chief inspector. I said, look, this is a situation. This is where I found myself. Uh, and he kind of went, well, there's no real recruitment, but let me let me have some conversations. And about four months later, he said, OK, put an application in and we'll get you back across. Um, so I went back across, went back onto response again, uh, which is where I spent then most of my career until right towards the very end when I just got a job on CMPG, when the career took a little bit of a southward turn. Cool. OK, uh, well, let's let's talk about that. So let's talk about it, because uh, a lot of people resign in, they leave the, the job for other reasons. Talk about your story. Um, what was the decision making process behind? Uh, yeah, the career change. So so essentially, I uh, I'd gone to an instant in my old patch. Now, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit cagey on what I say here, because there's certain officers who were involved in that. And I don't know who's connected with who. Of course. Um, of course. But the, essentially, an incident took place in Tamworth, which is where I worked. Uh, I went to the instant, I, I was not long qualified with a taser, uh, and I discharged the taser, and it was at the time we got body cam footage. Mm. I discharged the taser without giving a warning uh, to the subject. And the subject, you know, it, he, for all intents and purposes, I believe it's justified and I stand by that decision this, to this day. Yeah. Uh, other people would question that, that it wasn't. Um, but taser discharged, guy gets locked up. Uh, no, don't think anything more of it. And about a month and a half later, I roll into the backyard one morning and professional standards are kind of sat there waiting for me. Um, and it's basically papers to say uh, excessive use of force and assault, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and there was another investigation running parallel to this, which I won't go into, but there was one yeah. running parallel to it. Yeah. Uh, so they suspended me at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I kind of sat there and went, shit, well, you know, what, what do I do here? Because yeah. this, this, this doesn't happen in the bill. Yeah, this doesn't, yeah. Happen in life. <laughs> this doesn't happen in life. What do you do now? <laughs> and, uh, so I'm sat. No, the only bonus, and there, there is a positive to this story, because my youngest daughter was about three months old when this happened. So I was suspended on full pay and essentially full time childcare as well. So wow. I've got a great relationship. So I, I always look at that as the positive side of this story. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I was suspended for probably 14 months. Um, and to, I suppose, spent 14 months, it came to a bit of a head. I got a, a visit every month off professional standards uh, to say you're still spending, et cetera, et cetera. And anybody who's gone through this process, I feel for you because it is horrendous. Yeah, I've heard. Um, yeah. yeah, so the, the, the force support almost on the face of it to what was told to friends and colleagues, mm. one thing, and what happened was they, they closed ranks like overnight Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it's it's probably pertinent to mention here. Back in 2011, 2012, probably even 2013, I was on a bit of a, a bit of a downward spiral, uh, making some bad decisions. Personal life, nothing to do with the job, but there were personal life decisions. Yeah. Uh, and when I reached out to the force for support at that point, it was here's a leaflet, off you go. Wow. Uh, so when this happened, I kind of almost anticipated that was what was going to come. Um, so yeah. I was suspended. Every month I get this knock on the door, you know, you still spend it as you notice for another 28 days, blah, 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 blah. And it uh, came to a bit of a head in 2015 when they said, okay, right, what we're going to do is go to a gross mixed conduct panel. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there thinking, okay, well, at least I'm going to get some kind of conclusion to this because life almost goes on hold because you don't really know past 28 days, you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, so many police officers. I mean, I've spoke as naturally. I've spoke to hundreds, going you know, approaching a thousand police officers, and the common theme is that when this happens and some suspend, suspended, it's like you're in that limbo. What, what do you do? Like, do you stay with the job or do you go back? And it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's not a nice place to be. And the support goes. It, it, well, it literally does. I mean, to to give you an example, I was. We decided to go out for a day, and, and this is going off track now a little bit, but yeah. we decided to go out for a day as a family just to leave the phones at home, just go away as a family for the day. Mm. Um, and I, so we went up to some butterfly farm somewhere. Uh, and because I didn't answer my phone, I got, I got home, I got 21 missed calls off a duty inspector. Wow. And because I didn't answer my phone, they put me on as a high-risk missing person. 
and we're, we're basically pinging the card on the AMPR system all the way back to my house. Christ. Uh, and so I turn up to like, uh, I get in the house, I ring obviously the inspector back, like thinking sort of drastics happened. And uh, he was like, oh no, I just need to check you're okay. But we've dispatched the police car to your parents' house, to <laughs> your, your in-laws' house, and obviously yours. I'm like, hold on a minute. It's just, you know, I've got a life besides Staffordshire Police. Yeah. But it, it, that is what it is. Anyway, yeah. um, getting to a head, uh, I get a federation, obviously, league representation, etc. cetera. Um, representation's very, very good guy, you know, fantastic guy, never never knock him for six. He's like, right, I think the, the answer to this will be probably a final written warning. I think that's what you're looking at uh, for non-compliance with national policy, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. We turn up to uh, headquarters, so, you know, you're in the tunic and you think, and everybody knows when you walk into headquarters with a tunic on, you're a ward or you get a bollock in. <laughs> yeah. And that's basically the only two times you've got it. Uh, yeah. So I turn up uh, and we're sat in the cafe on day one of this hearing. Uh, and he, he gave, basically goes over to professional standards who are sat on another table. Um, and he comes back and he says, right, we've got good news. We've got bad news. Uh, and I remember this conversation to this day because the good news was, they're offering me the option to resign right there and then on the spot. The bad news is they've brought some barrister down from London or up from London, should I say, who is a specialist in taser complaints, knows her stuff, uh, and basically is very, very good. Uh, and he kind of said to me at that point, you've got no hope of winning this case. That, that, that's your choice. So wow. you can go and fight it or you can just resign and walk away now. It's your choice completely. Wow. What did, uh, how, how did you, when that, when you heard those words, how did you feel? What, what kind of emotions run over your mind? If I'm honest, at that particular moment, pissed off, I thought, mm. you know what? Fuck you. Yeah. I'm going to make you go through the two days hearing. Mm. Uh, I know what the outcome's going to be already. Mm-hmm. So my, mentally, I'm, I'm out of the room. I'm not, I'm not even interested now with what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but we went through the hearing, you know, and rightly or wrongly, they, they did some stuff that I don't agree with, that they should have done. Mm-hmm. Um, I did, you know, I put my point across, they put their point across. Uh, the panel made the decision and it was effectively dismissed there and then on the spot. Mm. Now, that that was probably the most surreal feeling because when I'd actually got that piece of paper that said, right, that's it, you are done. I walked out of the cafe, I walked out of headquarters. I was escorted to my car uh, and escorted to the front gates. And then it was like, right, that's it, you're done. Wow. And uh, I was so I, I kind of sat there at a few minutes at the front gate going, well, that's just 14 years that's gone down the pan. Well, th- well this is it, right? 14 years, you've given your life to, a, to an organisation and, it's, you know, they've not supported you through that, you know, traumatic experience. And, you know, in reality, you're doing the right things and trying to protect you know, the community in, in dis, disarming, uh, disarming your, um, your, your taser, right? And, and now all of a sudden, that's it, they've cut ties. How, how does that feel? Like that cutting was, ties with the police? It was probably, at that moment, it was probably the biggest kick in the ball I think I've ever felt. Because <laughs> I just sat there and went, shit. Yeah. Right, now I've got real problems because now I've got a missus, a young child at home. I've mm. got no job bar like a month's salary due next month. Mm. Um. And, you know, th- this has been a way of life since I've been, like, 19 years of age. These, Because, yeah. as you'll know, in the police, it becomes your lifestyle to socialise with these people. Yeah. You, you work long shifts with these people, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So I drove out headquarters, and I can remember just getting home and going, I don't, I don't, I don't even know what to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know the missus already knew, because I'd already preempted it from the day before. Yeah. You know, what was coming. Um, and I could, we went for a Chinese, bizarrely. A Chinese. I just sat there and went... <laughs> It's like it was comfort food at that point, I think. Yeah. And I wake up the next morning and I was like, right, shit, what am I going to do? I need to start looking at jobs. Mm. Um, so that that's kind of where I started the, the look at, you know, what can you get into quick? What's available? Because uh, at this point, I'm just thinking income, income, income. Yeah. I just need something to get, you know, keep us ticking over. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, in terms of the police inside, it was. Uh, and, and to this day, you know, I'll be very honest in, in, in this conversation that back in 2011, 2012, 2013, I wasn't a very nice person. Mm. Uh, I didn't even like myself for quite a long time of that period. Mm. Uh, and some people took, I suppose, 
whether they took that opportunity or not, they cut ties with me at that date. And I haven't spoken to those people. We were good friends. Yep. Uh, I haven't spoken to those people since. Mm-hmm. Some, some I've passed in the street and we'll say hello and that's it. Some, you know, I can walk past or be as close as I am to you now, Alex, on the yep. screen. And they wouldn't even acknowledge I exist. Wow. Was that, was that due to the job changing you as a person? You know, a lot, a lot of cops I speak to, like their, their minds and their skepticism, their negativity on the world creeps in. For, for you, was, was that the case or was it something? Unreal? I think, I think it's a combination of, and I don't, some people might understand this, some people might not. I found that no matter what's going on in your personal life, when you turned up to work, you had a professional life mm. and you had to deal with other people's problems. Mm. What that meant was this, this personal life almost just didn't get dealt with. So all the stuff that was going on in the back of my mind and, and in my personal life wasn't getting handled, but I was able to turn up and deal with other people's issues day in, day out, day in, day out. Mm. Um, and the one time I sort of reached out to Staffordshire Police for support. Uh, and like I said, I was given a leaflet and said, there you go, that's mm. who you need to call. Uh, and that was it. There was no welfare follow-up or anything from there. Um, and so, you know, I, I look at it as it was a good 14 years. It shaped me to who I am. It's given me a lot of experience I wouldn't have had otherwise. Uh, you know, they gave me 14 months childcare. I'm not paying back by Staffordshire Police anymore <laughs> watching this. <laughs> yeah. um, but yeah, you know, it gave me 14 months at home with my daughter yep. that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Uh, and I just look at it as, you know, the few friends I've come out with are exceptional friends mm. the rest of the people you know we had good relationships but that is perhaps forced because of the job and yeah. no i'm not i don't have that you know if we were to go and sit in a bar what would we actually talk about because yeah you know that, that's nature of the beast yeah of course uh, first of all, before we move on, I just want to say thank you for your transparency and honesty there. It's, you know, it, that makes the podcast what it is, so thank you. Um, you. With regards to um, you leaving the police, so, so you've left the police now or you've been dismissed and you're like, shit, you know, income, I've got a family, what do I do? What kind of jobs and interview process do you go through to, to get the next job? What is the next job? Well, so, uh, so I'm sat there day one after leaving. I'm like, right, what am I going to do? So I start picking up the phone and just start ringing anybody I know. It's nothing to do with the police, but I know who's either employed or got a business or anything. And just like, you know, who who can employ me? Um, and I, I knew sales was always the easiest one because if you go on Indeed and you type in sales, there's like a bazillion jobs come up. Yeah. If you go on Indeed and type in, I don't know, something else, nothing comes up. Uh, so I was like, right, sales, that's where it's got to be then. So I end up uh, making a call to a little uh, used car plot in Stafford, uh, knew the owner anyway, and said, look, this is a situation, I need a job. Uh, and, and I was taken on pretty much the following day. Wow. Um, you know, and bear in mind now, I've come from a 40 grand a year salary. I'm now at 1,200 quid a month uh, and then commission. Uh, wow. And so I'm like, this is a pay drop and a half. Yeah. Uh, and you've got to get good quick. Otherwise, yeah. you so, so, so you've gone into basically, is it a, you say used car? Used cars, yeah. So used you had car. probably 30 cars on the plot, something like okay. that. Uh, and what is that day-to-day role like? You, you talk to customers who are looking at, because, you know, because I've been around top cars. Is it like you step in BMW and people say, oh, are you just looking? Do you need any help? Is that kind of thing you're doing? Uh, so it's that sort of process as well. Usually with used cars, a lot of people will be uh, calling because they've already seen something online. Right. Um, so, or they, you know, they've wandered past because we were on the outskirts of Stafford Town Centre. Mm-hmm. They wandered through and go, "Oh, I like the look of that, whatever it is." Right. Um, so, it went from they were doing roughly 15, 20 cars a month, uh, and, and I was kind of like, "Right, well, I need more money than 15, 20 cars is going to make me." So, I kind of just bammed and hammered, uh, and we, I think, when I left, we were doing about 35, 40 cars a month. Wow. Um, so, so, so basically, you you increase their revenue in the business. Absolutely. Increased, increased it. And it was, some of it was simple, like they didn't have a Facebook page. You know, they didn't have each, as the cars come in stock, any history putting out there. Um, it was photographing cars. I valeted cars, uh, fixed them a couple of times. Wow. Um, yeah, it was, it was proper backstreet garage, but it, at that time it was a job and I needed something quick. Of course, absolutely. So, so you know, I'm, let's pretend I'm a customer. I'm walking yep. in to, to buy a car. What kind of cars did you sell? Just like 
Vauxhalls or? Yeah, so yeah. anything anything up to about 10 grand. Okay, cool. So I'm looking for a car. Um, I'm just browsing, you know, would you then approach me and say, hey, do you need any hand? You know, is that kind of thing? And then build a relationship from there. So uh, in those days, and this is before I'd gone any sales course, I'd go, hey, Alex, you know, which car are you looking at? Mm. Uh, or have you come to look at one particular car? And then you might say, oh, yeah, actually, you've got a red mini on on uh, Auto Trader. Mm. Brilliant. I know where that is. That's over here. Let me show you. Let me get the keys. Um, what do you think? Blah, 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 blah. Have you got a part exchange? Um, let me get you on a test drive in it. Let me get you the keys and uh, some trade plates. Let's get you out on a drive in it. See, let's see how the car handles. Mm -hmm. uh, you come back, by which time, if you've got a part X, I'd already... Now, I didn't know this was a sales process at this point. I was just doing what I thought was natural, but... yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd already appraised it and I'd already got like a finance quote and a cash price mm -hmm. sat there. So I'd be like, right, okay, how to get on? Oh yeah, it's really good. You know, what do you think? And you'd probably normally go, what do you think of my car? And I'd be like, all right. So if we're cash exchange, this is the, this is the, the balance to change, you know, four grand. Mm -hmm. If you want to do it monthly, it's going to be 200 quid a month over three years, right. 150 over four. Uh, and that was the general gist of it. Cool. Okay. Um, so with the 1,200, that was kind of the basic salary. And then you've got the commission. Was the commission, you know, how, how was it a percentage based? It uh, was uh, 20 quid a car. 20 quid a car. Yeah. So Wow. It, it was low. It was really low. That's um, crazy low. Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's that really, really low. Okay. And obviously, how many cars were you personally shifting a month? It would have been around 35, 40 a month wow. on average. So um, it the owner was as tight as they come. Uh, so you get a commission on the car. Yeah. You'd then, if you sold a warranty or some finance, he'd give you like another tenner for the warranty, another yeah. tenner for finance, um, and and such like that. Great. So, okay. But then you're also handling the complaints because there is nobody else. It's literally you know it's yeah. you and, and one of the lads and that's it. Yeah. Um, and then I, I was there for probably about a year, I think, yeah. maybe just under. Yeah. I kind of went. I want to go main dealer. I want to you know I want to get the the main dealer experience. So yep. I start ringing up some recruiters because uh, I learned very quickly you can't just get into a main dealer quite as easy as you get into used cars. Okay, why is that? Um, they all seem to like recruitment agencies for okay. some reason, apart from the big, big companies who've got their own internal teams like Sitna. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them are like recruitment agencies. Okay. So I got a recruiter and I got interviewed and went to Nissan over in Canuck. Okay. Um, completely different experience to your, your little backstreet garage. Now you've got KPIs, you've got performance targets, you've got mm. mystery shoppers. Uh, you've also got a manager who was the biggest dick on this planet I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> why, why was he a dick? He was, uh, no, no offense to anybody from any other country. He was French. He mm -hmm. was very arrogant. Mm -hmm. uh, he got his own traumas in life, which I think had made him a little bit the way he was. Yep. But like he, he, he did not care if uh, you were sat with a customer. If he needed to shout at you, you would be shouted at that regardless. In front of everyone? In front of everyone, across the showroom, across the customers. Wow, okay. Uh, so I lasted with them five and a half months. Wow. Uh, and, I, and I just couldn't, I just couldn't deal with him. Yep, yep. Toxic um, culture, right? Yeah, massively, massively. So he had one lad who'd been with him about 10 years. You know, yeah. this lad was given all the leads. Everybody else had to go and find their own. Mm. Um, and this lad would do phenomenally well with sales, but because he got 50% of his work just handed to him on a plate. Mm. Um, and, I, and I just couldn't cope with it. So I went off. I got offered a, a startup, a tech startup approach me about electric vehicle driver training yeah. in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, too early for the market, it would appear, because now it would be booming. But back then it wasn't. Yeah. It's kind of new. But I took this opportunity. I jumped across. I was like, right, let me, you know, let me go and have a go at this. Uh, we did okay on sales, but it wasn't enough for a tech startup. You know, you need to turn the numbers quick. Mm -hmm. uh, and there wasn't enough revenue coming in. But there was enough demand for the driver training, which was, and we were about 19 times more expensive than the only competitor at that time, which was the AA. Right, okay. So, so we had a bit of a, a battle. Uh, I stayed with them for six months. Mm -hmm. And then in 2017, I fell into packaging, mm -hmm. uh, pharmaceutical packaging. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is where I found Grant Cardone, or I didn't find him. I was given Grant Cardone. 
Yeah. Uh, now, I would kind of knew Grant Cardone quite a bit because he did a lot of automotive sales training. So I watched him on YouTube. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd connected with him on platforms. Um, so that we were in, we're in sort of this meeting one day. And, and this, so this packaging business was owned by a Plymouth Brethren family. Mm -hmm. If you've ever heard of them. No. Um, very, very old school culture, uh, Christian culture, but very old school yeah. in the way to do things. But very, very cash rich business. Yeah. Um, but they love figures like they they knew you Excel spreadsheets were their baby. Like every Monday you'd have reports and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is right, we've got this training package. Uh it's cost eight thousand pounds per rep, and this is Grant Cardone's package. Amazing. So so we're all like jumping on this Grant Cardone's package. And every 30 days you get a call with Grant Cardone and or one of his team. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was phenomenal. It was like it was it was almost uh, it was process driven, and it, it made for for me it was easy to convert then to oh the sales process. I mm. understand it because I, for the policing background, you're very process driven. Mm -hmm. If X happens, do this. If Y happens, do that. Yep. And this kind of just fitted with sales. Uh, and don't get me wrong, some of some of the like the segments you go ooh. <laughs> can't say that to people like just sign anyway just yeah. sign yeah um, so, so i think i think it's fair to just to say that for those who don't know who grant cardone is i personally like him obviously jamie does as well but he's an american entrepreneur um he's got a uh, phenomenal company a sales company he, he helps businesses with their sales processes and sales teams um he's wrote some for books some i think uh, sell first is that right uh sell before you sold i think it is sell before you uh, sold um the closer survival guide yeah 10 10x uh that's right um and yeah there's a few others but he's a phenomenal you want to check him out grant cardone um and he's got a product which you're now on you've got access to yeah, right yeah. and what's Absolutely. that called? what's that called cardone university is it cardone university amazing so cardone university very much like shift to success it's portal based uh, you, you, you know, you progress through the portal, you can go back, you can watch it again. Mm -hmm. um, the conditions of you signing up to his package is that you have to role play for 20 minutes every morning with somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's non-negotiable. You get a 10x planner, which is essentially, it's like a to-do book every day, but it's based targets and, and what you're planning to do. Um, but it opens up the world of, you know, what to say, how to anticipate what people are going to say, and then react before they act so to yeah. speak yeah um so on this package you know phenomenal package i i think far the odd the odd segment where you go that's far too american and you can tell that's an american line yeah um you know i i perhaps converted some of it to like a british version almost mm -hmm. uh, but there is an interview where he did i know he mentioned this on the call where he, he does think that the, the british public are too reserved in terms of talking about the money and asking about money why do you think that is? Because I've noticed that. I, I, I've definitely noticed that. Americans and Australians are very like, yep, get your credit card out, that kind of thing. We're, we're British are like, they, they almost cringe about money. What, why is that, Jamie? What, what do you think it is? I think it's, I, I think it's, we have a bit of a stiffer upper lip. So mm. money is like a, not something to be discussed. We'll email it. We'll talk, you know, it, it needs to be a seen figure rather than a, a mentioned figure. Mm. Um, and it also... I suppose to some degree then allows a polite exit out of the deal if you go if i said to you okay uh this package is going to cost you ten thousand pounds you go oh ten grand mm. in america they'd probably go do you know what mate ten grand no chance i ain't doing it yep. here we're probably more like just won't respond to emails ever again let, let, let me uh, let me ask the missus and never and then never pick up <laughs> yeah. right yeah never never see it ever again so <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah but it, it, that was one of the one of the things and so we started implementing it into into this business mm -hmm. um, this business was doing i think about four million quid at the time in packaging wow um so we've got contracts with nhs we've got drugs manufacturers etc cetera, etc cetera. uh and then we started going after customers that perhaps the business had never gone after because we just thought it's too hard to get the business right, NHS all, yeah it's nhs is all tenders so as long as you submit the right documents boom it's done whereas to go to drugs manufacturers big drugs manufacturers you know they, they want that relationship they want that you, you've got to hit hard to get in uh but we started implementing it and we started doing it and we started working so we, we won some uh well i want to deal with pharmacy group that they tried to get in with for seven years and couldn't get wow. uh, we did it in three months and they've turned over 
just over half a million quid then for the rest of that year. Wow. Um, and now, I mean, I still speak to the owners very occasionally. Uh, and the business is now doing 15 million quid in packaging. That is phenomenal. And, and from based on your car uh, background, the car dealership, that was 1,200 plus a little bit of commission. Yeah. What kind of numbers were you producing there? What, was the basic high and then more commission or? Yeah, so my basic there was 34K. Yeah. Uh, and then commission, it was, so the way they worked the commission was based on, you have a group of accounts, which mm -hmm. you assign accounts, like your, your normal accounts. Mm -hmm. If they produce, say, 50 grand in November, then you would be expected to produce at least 50,000 mm pounds -hmm. before you were paid any commission. And then it was 2.5% over then. Uh, you were paid commission on everything past that. Yeah. Um, so most months I'd come out with four, four and a half K a month. Wow. Give or take. That uh, is a sign of a good salesperson. Any good salesperson loves, you know, is completely fine with a low basic, but as long as the commission's there and it's a good commission, you know, because they you know, they're gonna, yeah, they're going to get it right. Yeah. So amazing. Um, and then I grew, I suppose, grew a little bit fed up with that role. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of wanted to pull it back into car sales. So I went back into car sales for eight months. Um, and I suppose I enjoyed it because I went to a company over in Derby, a uh, premier car supermarket in Derby. Yep. Um, so I was there for eight months. You know, Neil, who owned that place, I studied him in that time because he was an entrepreneur in his own right. Mm -hmm. Neil had gone from like 20 cars at like a value of about five grand because uh, they're all bangers. And now he got three sites and he, he was turning over in excess of six million a year. Wow. Um, uh, and phenomenal guy, really phenomenal guy. But more interestingly was one of the investors uh, in that company. So he was a guy called Paul. He was about 76, I think, when I met him. Mm. Uh, and Paul was just, Paul would be as normal as, as you and I are talking now. Yeah. Um, but Paul had, Paul actually owned two streets in London, completely outright, wow. uh, that he rented. He'd got, his house was an old hospital in Leicester. Uh, yeah, he drove around a 56 plate BM that was banged up to, to bits. And, and to walk in, you'd just look at him and go, all right, yeah, yeah okay. But he was actually a, a multimillionaire. Wait, is it, the, the whole goal is not to look rich and, you know, yeah. you know, is to be rich, right? That's it. That's it. And so he was telling me, you know, invest, 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 any of your income, invest it. Uh, and at that time, he was all about property, but that's because that's where he'd made his money from. Yeah. Uh, but he was like, invest, 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 Joe. You've got to invest. Don't, don't blow it. Um, but yeah, going back to it, I left after eight months, mainly because it was seven days a week, pretty much to make the numbers work. Yeah. Uh, and obviously still having a very young family at home. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I went to Grono. So Grono was my, uh, and what, what's apart from the car trade, what I've always done is jump trades to completely new sector. Yeah. I've never stayed in one sector. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I went to Grono and unbeknownst to me, when I, when I went to Grono, I was interviewed by, uh, so I was interviewed by two directors. Uh, one was a part owner in the business, which I didn't know at the time. Mm -hmm. The other one was a brand new sales director they just brought in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I originally went in to manage. So for those who don't know, Grono is basically a landscaping supplier, so landscaping product supplier to builders merchants. Mm -hmm. They had one contract, which was with Juicens, which is national. Okay. Um, and they, they basically were looking for an account manager for that. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I was going for the interview for. It's so turned up and we're having this discussion and about halfway through, they go, they sort of sit there and go, how would you feel about doing new business? Uh, and I can go, yeah, crack on. Uh, if anything, I prefer it because it's more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas most people don't like new business because it's more of a challenge. Mm. <laughs> um, so I'm sat there and they go, right, okay, you're on new business. Then you start two weeks time. Uh, you know, here's your phone, here's your laptop, here's your car. Mm -hmm. um, and what I didn't know at this point was I wasn't getting given any accounts. I got nothing really. I got like, you know, accounts that spend like 30 grand, which is, in the grand scale of things, pennies. Yeah. Um, and I also didn't know at the time that Grono was not very financially secure as a business. Ah, okay. Um, so, and this obviously, for obvious reasons, I wouldn't tell you that because yeah. there you yeah. go, shut them off before I even start. Yeah. Uh, so I rocked up on day one, you know, right, I'm out with uh, my boss for a week and he's like, right, off you go then, you know, this is your role now, it's go and get new business in. So like first two months, I'm, I'm clawing, you know, a lot of these builders merchants got agreements in place, supply agreements, preferred suppliers. So I'm clawing away and clawing away and clawing away. I'm like, 
this is just shit. Just, yeah. I can't get anywhere. I can't sell anything. It's like, yeah. Yeah. what do I do? And uh, so I start, I just go into a merchant's up in the northeast. And it just happens to be their head office was right next door. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the guy said, oh, you need to go and talk to Ben next door. So I go and talk to Ben next door. And Ben said, right, well, funny enough, our buying group's just about to renew their agreement. Mm-hmm. Get a presentation together. Be in Southampton on this date. I'll put you on the list. Uh, so we competed against 21 competitors for this supply agreement into, into I think it was like 30, 30 actual customers. We opened 150 branches up. Mm. And we got it, bizarrely. Wow. Um, wow. So, and you did the presentation for that? Yeah, so I went in the presentation. Uh, I took my boss with me because I was like, you know, this is the first time I've done a big presentation to, yep. the, to this. And so I'm sat there and I'm like, right, okay, you know, great. Doors are open. They, they said, that's it, you're in. Um, supply agreements in place. You can now go. Now, what that meant was the door was open so you could go and talk to these people. Doesn't mean they have to buy from you. Right. Um, so now it's like, right, okay, well, now you've got to go out and get these people to actually start buying the stuff. Yep. Uh, and it was it was nine months of consistent hammer, 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 you know, kind of get and see, can I do this, can I do that? Uh, uh, and, and then it started turning and turning. And then, excuse me, and then it, my boss left in the December when I joined. Uh, and so James, who was the MD there, said, okay, you're now the business development director for new business as of Monday. Wow. Um, here's a 10 grand pay rise. But now your responsibility is like three times because you've got to manage the reps, you've got to manage, um, you've got to manage sales figures, you've got to manage forecasting. Yeah. You, you know, you've got to learn all this and off you go. Uh, and so I'm there going, right, shit, back on YouTube over the weekend, they do forecast sales. <laughs> um, and, and I'll be honest, a lot of the stuff outside the Grant Cardone program, a lot yeah. of stuff I've just learned from people, yeah. asked questions, understood, uh, and then adapted to, to what suits. Mm-hmm. So, uh, start out day one, business development director, uh, and we've got a sales director on the Juicen account mm-hmm. who um, is very comfortable because Juicen's just naturally, we're a preferred supplier to them, just churns out numbers. You know, he doesn't have to do a lot. You ring yeah. people up occasionally and go, put a roll of grass on, join a pack a deck in. Yeah. And they churn out, you know, three and a half grand orders, no problem. Yeah. So, I'm there going, right, shit, well, what am I going to do then? So now I'm like hammering all these branches. I'm, I'm in Southampton. I'm in uh, the Northeast. I'm in Scotland. I'm pretty much anywhere yeah. that there is business um, to, to get. And uh, I can remember Ben, who was the guy who originally put me in touch. Uh, I said, Ben, uh, you know, I've looked at your figures, mate, and, and you've done phenomenal this year. You've done, you know, last year you did this, this, and this. Across your group, this is what you've done. So I can save you a little bit of money. I can save you like 50 pence a board put a container order on. Uh, and so I come back with this order for like 70 grand worth of composite decking. Wow. And uh, I go into the office and go, right, there's, there's my orders for the week. Uh, and Lionel, who owned Grono, just kind of looked at me and went, what do you mean 70 grand? I went, it's just, it's just natural, isn't it? Just bulk sell. And he, he just kind of went, why are we bulk selling to everybody then? I said, well, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> oh <my goodness. laughs> so I'm there going, so Lionel's like really around the office now. I mean, like panic attacks going, right, that's it. We need to get more stock in and, you know, we need to sell more, sell more. Yeah. Um, but that was the turning point for the company. So we started bulk selling um, wow. into merchants. We still do like individual packs, yeah. but it yeah. was it was easier for us because we'd get a container to the port, deliver that container direct to site. They'd sort out the distribution. Everyone's a winner. We haven't touched it once it's landed onto the ports of the UK. Money saved on logistics. Wow. Um, so we started doing that. And then as, as it came towards the end of, so September, October last year, I'd already been in discussion with like some of the other key ones, Travis Perkins, Hughes Gray, and, and I knew Hughes Gray had got a problem. Uh, and every time I went to Wales, which is where the head office was, I'd call in and see Chris, who was the buyer for them. Mm-hmm. And, and I'd take him a Starbucks coffee because I knew he loved Starbucks coffees. So I'd, co- I'd rock up with my Starbucks coffee and he'd, he'd almost have to give me the 10 minutes because <laughs> I'd bought him a three pound coffee. Genius. So he's he's there going right okay yeah you yeah you know we're not ready to change yet and then I, I walk in one day and like Chris I know you're going to tell me you're not ready to change but I think you're ready to change aren't you and he kind of went Jamie yes wow wow uh, and that was literally it that was literally how the deal was done with Hughes Gray was over coffee and and yeah he just went yeah okay let's do it and how much is that kind of worth that that deal approximately so 
when I last spoke to James, they have done in themselves three and a half million quid this year with wow. Grono. Fun, absolutely um, phenomenal. So they, 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 the, the deal was because in the builders' merchant world, there's lots of stuff that goes on with like rebates, and backhanders, and dodgy deals, and <laughs> yeah. not actually backhanders for anyone listening, but like <laughs> it's like rebates, everything's about rebates and all that stuff. Yeah. And uh, so I'm sat there going, look, if I don't give you a rebate, I can give you a slightly better price on the boards. Uh, now I knew that what he was going to order because he'd already told me what he was spending with his current suppliers. I knew he was going to order container loads. And so what I already planned out is we'd strategically deliver to certain key branches and then we just send our vans in and deliver it out. So they were holding the stock. We were getting it from port direct to them and then just delivering it out to, to the branches so that we didn't touch it. The cost of logistics was still down and there's the rebates not there because we don't have to worry about it. Uh, so that was deal done. Uh, we went for lunch afterwards, you know, it was like, a, uh, and that lunch was a KFC bizarre thing because <laughs> he didn't like posh lunches. He didn't like weather wow. spoons, he didn't like anything. So absolutely phenomenal. So if the Gronos, like you were unaware that they were not in a great position, how did I probably business... would have gone, do you know, wow. I probably wouldn't have gone because you, you sit there as an employee, you have to sit there and go, if this company's in financial strife now, how, yeah. who, how are they going to pay me? Uh, and how they're going to pay everybody else? Well, and, you know, what, last in, first out. Well, what happened? I mean, obviously you came along and you've you've done all these deals. You know, the bull quarters, etc. You did the business double. So the business last year did when it finished. New business finished on six million quid. Jason finished on three and a half. Gee, wow, that's um, phenomenal. This year, when I was talking to James, I'm still quite good friends with James, who's the MD over there. Um, you know, we go for a drink sometimes, whatever. Yeah. Uh, new business this year will finish on 10 million. Uh, and Juice will finish on 2.8, bizarrely. Wow. Wow. Uh, so, absolutely phenomenal. So, 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 Jamie, you obviously, you know, you've, you've learned the skills required to obviously, you was good at sales, but you've leaned in, you've learned obviously from Grant and the teachings there. You've got yourself out there. You've done the hard stuff as well. You've been going into companies banging the phones, you know, uh, car salesman as well, which is yeah. uh, kind of difficult. <laughs> um, so with all of that, you've kind of got all this experience and you've now found this job and you've, you're have smashing the hell out of Gronos and you're making their business better and you're getting paid commission. Why, why business? Why, why now have you, you're the founder <laughs> of Building Profits, you've joined yeah. Shift Success, why business? So I stalked you, Alex, for about two years. Two years. I'd have, probably, I'd have probably joined it as soon if I hadn't gone to Grono. So the <laughs> Grono thing probably helped and didn't help at the same time. Um, but I can't, and the only reason I didn't join two years ago, because I spoke to Carol at that time, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, was the fact I'd just got this job at Grono and I was like, I, I don't know how much I can commit. Yeah. You know, it, it, I'm not going to be fully in, in the game, if I'm yeah. honest. And I, I kind of sat there and, and I looked at all the sales jobs I've done. Uh, and, you know, we, every role I've had, there's been rough moments that every business has. We sit there and go, do you know what? Lionel is sitting pretty, looking at a part of cash. Now, don't get wrong, I've been paid well out of that business. Yeah. There's no two ways about it. I was paid well. But you sit there and go, that is a phenomenal amount of money. And what I've been paid versus that pot of money is minimal. Yeah, got you. Uh, so that was, that was one point. And then I was kind of like, but when I start in sales, who helped me? Mm. And the, until I went to this company and they paid for training, I was like, there's not really a lot there unless you start looking at YouTube. The trouble is then you can have like conflicting, you know, every sales trainer, James White to me would be different yeah. because we've all had different experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so you start looking at it and going, I could make a real impact on somebody's life. I could change either the business, if it's the business, if it's a person who wants to get into sales or is in sales and wanting to grow, you know, I, I understand that process now of what it takes to get to that level. Yeah, yeah, because you, um, you've backed up with the results, right? You've, you've done yeah. it over and over again with other businesses. So what, so what is Building Profits then? Talk to me. We're in a bar. I said, oh, yep. what do you do? You're founder of Building Profits. What is that? So Building Profits is sales training. It's, it's aimed at bringing sales back to a natural, natural flow rather than regimented. Uh, I'm not big on scripts. I'm big on sort of being natural to, to a degree, mm -hmm. finding a process. But ultimately, it's about business growth. It's about getting people where they want to be financially with their business. Uh, and that's increasing their sales numbers. Or if you're a salesperson, it's about getting you basically the commission you want uh, and increasing your numbers. It's about education around uh, your life or your business's life 
to to impact change and and move forward amazing it's a uh... You know, hopefully people who have been listening to the show understand that sales is everything in business. If you do not have sales in your business, you don't have a business or you won't uh, f- for much longer, essentially. It's absolutely everything. Um, so who's your typical customer, Jim? Who, who do you work with? I've been seeing you wins inside our community, but for those who can't see that, do you want to share with the type of customer you work with? So at the minute, I'm working with a variety. Uh, I am working with a PT, personal trainer. Um mm-hmm. I've got a group of solicitors now that have just come on board. Um, I've quoted a group of accountants, which is kind of, we're at a point of saying it's going to be next year that they want to kick it in because of yep. change of staff and stuff. Yeah. Um, I would ultimately say for me, it's a small business under 3 million quid mm-hmm. uh, in turnover that are looking for growth to get over that 3 million pound barrier. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, or, you know, even up to that 3 million pound barrier, depending on what your turnover is. Yep. Uh, normally you've got, either just the business owner or business owner plus one doing sales. Yeah. And again, they're looking to increase the sales process, to, oh, sorry, sales team, expand growth. Um, I, I'm, I'm not really the person to talk to if you just want to plateau your sales. Yeah. Um, that That's not for me. I, I'm all about sort of getting there and, and, you know, let's grow, let's work, let's boom. Amazing. Um, Amazing stuff. With the PT, and uh, do you want to share the story about what, what you've, the results you've you've actually turned that PT's businesses around. Do you want to explain what, what you've done? Yeah, so so uh, the PT he was he's a good friend of mine anyway. Um, mm-hmm. I've charged him for this process because you know time is money and all the rest of it. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, but he had a, a business where he's doing the boot camp and he got two um, two personal one to one clients a boot camp which had five people in. He did every Wednesday and he was making like fifty quid off the boot camp and couple hundred quid uh, Mm. on the Mm one-to-ones. We've got him boomed up to, uh, he's got three boot camps a week now. He's increased his costs, so they are producing around 150 quid a session. Uh, His one-to-ones are in excess of 15 now, I think it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we're just getting ready, or I say we, I use that in a loose sense, it's him really, but um, we're just putting together a package for wedding uh, fitness. So uh, the plan around that was basically nobody else does it. Uh, specific packages for weddings where you know you know everybody's like before the wedding I need to get fit I need to you know I need to look my best on the day Uh, we've done a deal with six hotels around where he lives uh, to recommend him Um, and he's flying he's flying the packages are due to launch he was originally launched them in January we pulled it back to December so that all the people who propose in December packages are ready for you know their Christmas present almost yeah have a fitness so, uh, so yeah, he's doing really well, doing phenomenal. Um, yeah, he's doing awesome, doing Amazing. absolutely awesome. Great. So, and what kind of do you think? Because obviously, you know, I think people put almost like a, blo- a, a mindset block there when it comes to sales and um, maybe have the wrong end of the stick when it comes to sales. What's some of the kind of sales myths that you've kind of found out that maybe your clients are thinking wrongly about, or maybe you see it when you, when you speak to people, what kind of myths have you kind of getting? The, from people? the biggest one you get is I've quoted the customer. They'll come back if they want to buy it. <laughs> um, that, that's a huge one. And that's bizarre that, so uh, I ring you up and you say, okay, Jamie's going to cost 150 quid or 200 quid or whatever it may be a month. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I go, right. Okay, bro. And you go, right. He'll call me back when he, he wants to, to join up. And it's almost, I don't know whether it's egotistical or whether it's uh, confidence. Um, and this perhaps falls back to that British thing a little bit about asking about money and stuff. Yeah. Of we don't like to ask for the business. So it gets a little bit like, ooh, who, who should who, who should ring who, who should have contact with who. Yeah. Um, so that, that's a real huge one. Uh, and my advice on that is just pick up the phone and ask the question. Yeah. I read a, uh, so it's basically in the follow-up, right? Yeah, absolutely. You've got, so got to follow up. Yeah. I, read, I read a stat once that 80% of salespeople don't follow up with their prospects. And um, 80% also, um, I think, of sales happen between the fifth and 12th follow up. So yeah. it goes to show it's always in the, it's all in the relationship, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the way I say it to a lot of people is unless that problem is the biggest thing on that person's plate right now, like, you know, they're not sleeping because of it or whatever. Well, you've got to bear in mind, the minute I put the phone down to you, I've yeah. got my normal life coming back to me. You know, my missus, I've got what's for dinner, the kids, yeah. what's going on in my job, you know, what's what, what's going on around me. Yeah. And so you, you kind of fall off that radar and back to the bottom of the queue again. 
Yeah. Um, so you need to be, as long as obviously the needs there, you can't force people to buy what they don't want to buy or they don't need to buy. Of course. Um, yeah. But you need to be back at the top of that radar to say, look, you know, let's get this problem fixed for you. Yeah. You know, whatever that may be, if it's fitness, yeah. let's get you, let's get you signed up. Let's get you on that program. Let's get your fitness working. You know, you want to look great for Christmas. You know, mm. you know, when you put that turkey in your belly, you want to feel like yeah. you've worked hard for the last seven weeks for it. Um, whereas if you don't, you, you just basically, if you've got a competitor who does follow up, they're more likely to get the business. There you go. Right. The fact that they've called and you haven't. That's, that's, I want everyone to, to, to listen to that. I'm going to say it again, if you don't follow up on your competition, do the likelihood of them getting the business is going to be much you know, increased, right? They're going to secure the business that even though you've made the first contact, it's all in the follow up. You know, we say, you know, we've said to you, Jamie, we've said to other people yeah. inside our community, it's not the customer's job to get in touch with you. It's yeah. your job as the entrepreneur and the business owner to get in touch with your customer. Okay. That's how you're going to grow your business. What are the kind of, um, Myths of you, do you feel, Jamie, that people have got a misconception about? Uh, one of the other ones that comes across frequently now is quoting. Now, this mm-hmm. does depend on the type of business you're in a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a lot of people who say, yeah, I don't need to quote. You know, they know my numbers. And this, this again, falls back to the same scenario. As soon as I put the phone down to you, I'm going to go back to my day life. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would always suggest quoting. Uh, I, always, I always say, well, you know, A, it's a touch point. It's another touch point. B, it gives you a reason to follow up. It gives you two reasons to follow up, actually, because you can go, you can ring them back at the end of the day or the following day and go, did you get my quote? Mm-hmm. And then they go, they go, yay or nay. And then you go, right, okay, if you've got it, well, right, what I'm going to do is call you between three and four today. I want you to think about any questions you've got about that quotation and just list them down and we'll go through and answer any of those questions for you. And then by that point, you've got three touch points from the first call to, to that point alone. Um loom i use loom as well for yeah, follow-up yeah, yeah. uh yeah. which is a cool little app um what are the other ones the other ones are you've got a price match everybody in the marketplace mm. uh, and obviously robin waits big on this mm-hmm. um but you know you don't have to price match because my skill set is different to to james white to grant Cardone's, to whoever yeah. we're all yeah. going to be priced according to our own perceived value yeah and it's whether we can communicate that enough to a customer to say, right, you need to come with me because my experience says this, this, and this, and this is my cost. Yeah. If you've got somebody shopping for the cheapest price alone and nothing else, then they're probably not going to be your target customer because they're the ones that create the problems. They're the ones that ring you up and go, you know, this hasn't gone quite as you said it would. They're the ones that cost you money because then you have to fix what you've, you know, because otherwise then you get all the negative that comes back with it. Uh, if they're shopping price on its own, and nothing else, and they're not interested in anything else, it is a real, real tough customer then to turn around to say, you know, I'm here and everyone else is here. Yeah, absolutely. I hit the nail on the head. I mean, first of all, from a com- from a business point of view, it's like if you compete on price, that is a race to the bottom, right? You can't mm-hmm. do that. You've got to make yourself different. You're going to convey a benefit to the customer on perceived value, as you mentioned, Jamie. Um, but also, you know, your price, if, you, if you're listening to this episode, your price in business can be a great qualifier for your business. We qualify, you know, people join Shift Success based on price. We know if you can't meet this, great, you're definitely not going to be for us, right? Because Absolutely. it's about investing yourself. J- Jamie, what kind of mistakes do you find that people make in sales? Like when, you, when you're working with someone, you're working with your PT yep. or maybe someone else you're working with, um, and you listen to their calls, you listen to their approach. What are they doing wrong? Do you think? I think a lot of it in the first in the first calls. So like you know, first initial ones. Mm-hmm. A lot of it's calling people mate, buddy, pal. Uh, and, and this is a very small one, but at this stage, and now me and you, Alex. Obviously, I've known you for a little while now. Yeah. So I'd yeah. clash you as a mate, and I yeah. would call you unless we we're on a business call. Yeah. I might I might still call you mate on a business call because yeah. of the relationship. But yeah. at, in the first points, you are not their mate, not their buddy, and not their pal. You are there, and what you, if you cold call particularly, well, you bear in mind you're stopping somebody's busy day. Mm. If you want warm, warm calls, it's a little bit different, but you still want to be addressing them by at least first name. You know, hi Alex, how's it going? Yep. It's respectful. Um, it's 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 just a respect thing, and it's it's a point of you know who they are already. You're not calling mate because mate can imply you actually don't know the name. Yeah, uh, you, you, oh, you know what? You, that's a pet peeve of mine. You've just, that's a pet peeve of mine when someone that I don't really know 
calls me mate or, or, or dude. A salesperson called me dude. And <laughs> it just put me off them straight away. It's, I don't know what it is. It's just like, yeah. I didn't like it. Um, it's too friendly, too quick. Yeah. And, and I, you know, my mates take the piss out of me and call me mate and buddy and all that kind of thing and pal. And so it's not like a, like a yeah. thing I don't like full stop. It's just someone I didn't know who I spoke to really just called me it. Uh, and do you find that happens a lot then with, with with people? Do you reckon it's like a nervous thing why they do it? Or it's, I think it's probably, it happens more so in certain trades I've noticed. Right. Um, so like the builder's trade, um, yeah. they will notoriously call people mate, buddy, pal. Um, yeah. You know, web companies, if they're big enough, they'll normally address by first name in the first call. Mm. Smaller businesses tend to be mate, buddy, pal. Mm. Um, and I think what it actually translates to is you think you've got to be somebody's friend to make them buy off you. Mm. Uh, so, you know, if I'm mating you, not literally, obviously, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but do, do you know, if I'm calling you mate, it, there's yeah. almost that like, oh, we, we're friends, so you will buy off me. There's that yeah. mindset of that's where it's going. Got when you. in reality, at this stage, they might not need your product or service. You might be too expensive. They might go, you know, actually, there's 900 things more important than what you're offering. Mm. It doesn't at this stage. It doesn't matter whether you are friends or such. Right. Yeah. Uh, further down the line, you know, as that relationship goes on, uh, you know, I could ring up uh, Ben from the Builders Merchants Company, which we won't name, but I could ring up now and say, "Mate, do you want to go for a beer?" And we go for a beer. Yeah. But that's because the relationship's already there. Mm. We've worked together for a little while. He knows what I'm about. I know what he's about. Um, it's people almost becoming a little bit clinging to the end result. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I need that sale. I need that sale. I need that sale rather than is this the right sale for this customer? And no, can no. I deliver on what they want? It, you've nailed it again. So, so I, I feel like if you're desperate for the mm -hmm. sale, I feel like the per people you're speaking to can, can feel that and it comes across the wrong way. And also when you, cause you can't, I mean, you can try and get the results as best you can, but if someone doesn't buy from you, you can get like emotionally down on it and it's just not a nice place to be in. Uh, so what, I mean, what we have a selection criteria in place at Shift Success. So we like, you know, we only let a certain amount of people through who can meet this criteria. If not, we, I've stood in front of a room full of cops, go and spend your money on Disneyland, not Shift Success if you can't commit to this criteria. For you then, and what you just explained, um, how would, would you recommend a selection criteria or would you recommend something else? Um, ultimately, it's you've got to understand the person and how their, their mindset is in business. Now, for some people, it's just the way they've always run. So if you go back to Grono, for example, they've mm. run penny to penny. So it would always be get the business, get the business, get the business. Mm. Uh, and for the first probably six, eight months I was there, that's what it was about. Get the numbers, get the numbers, get the numbers. But that was because the business on a desperation line. Right. Once Once you're off that desperation line, and you don't have to take on every single customer and you can say, right, okay, uh, I am, I'm only going to work with people who are, you know, uh, they've got the investment for 12 months. Uh, they're willing to, to work with me on a one-to-one -one basis. They're willing to listen. Uh, and I suppose these are all the standard criteria that you get with yeah. success and, and such. It, ultimately, you've got to qualify them as much as they're qualifying you. Yes. So, uh, you know, don't just take any old Tom, Dick and Harry on because they, 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 they're not the ones that will come back and bite you the worst. Yeah. Um, so selection criteria, you know, mindset is a big one, particularly in sales. The mindset has to be around. Are you, are you focused solely on uh, numbers and your outcome? Or are you focused on growing a business that you realize, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. I'm not going to walk in today and suddenly tomorrow you've got a million quid worth of orders. Yeah. It takes time. It takes relationships. Uh, or are you just attached? No, this happened yesterday. I was offered uh, to work with somebody yesterday. Um, and the guy offered me a reasonable amount of money to work with him. But he's like, I want it to be at like dull turnover in six months or I want my money back. And I'm sitting there going, well, we're just not, I'm just not the right person for you. Mm -hmm. I can't commit to you doing that in six months because A, it's going to factor on whether you listen to what I say. Mm. You've already told me you're flat out, can't cope with the work you've got. So actually where do you think this double turnover is coming from mm. uh, and see you know you've put a time frame of six months on it yeah i'd love to do it in six months but i'm not going to sit there and guarantee it when your mindset is you know numbers 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 but then you're physically involved in the business day to day so for me to to give my practices to you i need you to step back from that to 
to impl yeah. implement and impact and it's almost like you both got skin in the game right we're going to commit yeah. to doing this for you but actually you've got to do this 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 and this yeah. for that to work right absolutely and it's and that would be the same shift to success if somebody joins then went okay you know after 12 months alex this isn't working but actually all they've done is overtime for 12 months at the police yeah you'd be going well the reason it hasn't worked is because you haven't followed the process that's in place yeah, yeah. There's a thing uh, like chilling on Netflix or you know. Yeah, you know. Watch. Yeah, I get it. So it, it's it's really I would say uh, qualify and I learned this in the car trade. This is a really bizarre mm. picture, but as a car salesman, it was always sell, sell, sell. And then I went to uh, probably car supermarket after doing the Grand Cardone program, and his switch was well, actually, as well as a seller, you're also a buyer because you're buying in their vehicle. Mm -hmm. So qualify their vehicle as much as they're qualifying yours. You know, if the deal isn't right, the deal isn't right. It's it's no skin off anybody's nose. It's just, mm. but that's where you've got to be detached from the end outcome a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, so if you're, you know, if you're, uh, you need that money to come in, you will be, as you say, a little bit more desperate. You know, come on, come on, come on, please. You know, what do I need to do? Do I need to discount? Do I need to, Yeah. you know, what do I need to do? Yeah. Whereas if you go in, hold on a minute, for us this to work, this is what needs to happen on your side. This is what needs to happen on our side. If we're in the middle of a meeting, or you know, 60 40, you can give a little bit. Yeah. Then then absolutely you're ready to roll. Absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. I find like personally, like um mistakes when I hear people. I mean, I've just recently bought a car, funny enough. Um I saw, yeah. Yeah. Nice one. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and the people I spoke to, I mean, I spoke to it was online, sorry, it was over the phone. And you could, I could being in sales and you know developing my businesses in the property stuff and also in shift success you know i'm almost like can see the common mistakes that you know that they are a bit desperate or one thing that pisses me off they'll speak over me i'm speaking and bang they'll interrupt me and they'll speak over me and um, they're not asking any questions around you know my problems you know what is it about the car you'd like you know what is it you want to do with the car that kind of thing is almost like bang, bang, bang numbers. And the person I end up going with went above and beyond, like like literally finding the car for me, asking me questions. What do I do in business? Uh, are you going to travel, to, you know, take the missus somewhere? All those kind of general kind of insights he was gaining. And lo and behold, he got the sale, right? And not only that, but I thought it was that good, that caring that he, you know, now he knows I own a business training company and we've got business owners like you who may need cars in the future. We can put the details forward. So absolutely, I just wish more salespeople would take the time to develop the relationship, right? Because it's, it's about extending the relationship, not just closing the sale. Absolutely. And I think if I'm honest, I think having gone into that world, a lot of it comes down to you just expected to know when you rock up. Mm. There is some companies will have formal training in place, uh, which some is dated, some is quite outdated. Um, you know, I can remember my first car sales training package. It was two days, and there was this guy who reminds me of the Churchill nodding dog because that's all <laughs> he did. It was just like, and yeah. you shake the hand and you nod with the head and you smile at them, and you, you like, and that's the cringe worthiness that yeah. I want to get away from. Of you know, it's not all about smiling assassins or whatever, mm. slimy handshakes and and sly deals. It's about it's about me saying to you, Alex, okay, you've got a, a Mercedes right now. It's a three door, you know, what, what is it you like about that car? And what is it you're looking for in your next car? Mm. Uh, and you know, if you study you enough, you'll go, okay, you play golf. Okay. You need a boot that's big enough for golf then. Bingo. That's, that's what, that's what exactly what you did. So okay. straight away you're off with the golf yep. and you go, okay, how much traveling around the UK you do, and yep. you know, what's why an electric over a, a, a diesel or a petrol. Yeah. You've got a business, okay. It would make sense then to go to electrics. The back, the tax benefits are there. Yeah. Um, there you go. And then it'll probably have upsold you a charge point as well. <laughs> yeah, probably upsell. Yeah. <laughs> I think he did. He's, he's, he's got uh, coming back to me on that, but he's uh, he went for it. With with their uh, objections, what yeah. what, is, what are the most common objections that you've heard in relation to sales? I mean, you know, let me ask the missus. Let me ask the husbands. That's a, that's a huge one. Uh, so let me go and talk to my wife. Let me go and talk to my husband and I'll call you back. Um, now, you, you've got a couple of options on this one. And, and um, this this normally comes down to not qualifying them well enough in the beginning mm. of who else is the decision maker. And this is always the most brutal one to qualify on because you can't really say to somebody, if I said to you, 
are you the decision maker in your house? You probably go, of course I am, mate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In reality, you might discuss it with your partner. Yeah. But you ain't going to say that to me because Mel Provado says, hey, stuff you, I, you know, I, I made a decision for this house. Yeah, This yeah. is my role, you know, I'm king of the jungle. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that that's a big one that people come across. Uh, now, a couple of ways I handle it, and it depends on you, on how the call's gone as to what kind of objection handle you take on it. One of the ones I have used in the past, um, particularly in car sales and, and in big purchases, you know, like really expensive purchases is, I understand. I understand that it's a lot of money that you've got to lay out and I understand the commitment, you know, for a three year training program is X. Uh, I understand that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to get you all that information across in your email. That when we put the phone to call down, I'm going to let you go and have time to speak to your partner. Let's get a call booked in for tomorrow between one and two. Ask any questions, you know, hopefully your partner can make it then. Mm. Yep. You say, yeah. Yeah. Then we'll jump on a call between one and two tomorrow with your partner. Get any questions listed down that you have. Let's get on the call. Let's get them answered um, for you. Or the alternative one is, uh, and this is a Grand Cardone one, but I do quite like it is, I know when you've come to look at this car, you'll have already discussed this with your partner because nobody comes here without <laughs> talking to their partner about, you know, a two-seat convertible yeah. Mazda. Yeah, yeah, uh, and that, so that's what, a little bit more jovial, but of course. So, so what you're doing is basically getting both decision makers yeah. on with you, so you can handle objections together, right? I've, as I've quickly made... as possible, as well. If you haven't done it, uh, the ideal is obviously you do it in the beginning. So you, yeah. you know, you qualify at the beginning of your sales process. Mm. Uh, so, so for example, if it was yourself and and you know we we're looking at the car, I'd, I'd say right, is it just yourself who will be driving the vehicle? And you might say, well, actually, my partner might okay to so use it. Brilliant. When can you and your partner come and see the vehicle together so that we can talk through it and, and have a look at it? Fantastic. Great stuff. Got it. Uh, and then boom, straight away, you, you're back into it. And I know it came up the other week in the group, didn't it, where yeah. uh, this was an issue for somebody. And in that scenario, I'd say something along the lines of, you know, Alex, I appreciate you've got an issue with uh, your dark car and the dog's name now, but yeah. I know you've got a sausage dog. Got yeah. sausage. Rolo and uh, Cooper. <laughs> Rolo, there we go. Yeah. I know you've got an issue with Rolo. Uh, you you know we'll talk through the issues a little bit before we get onto a proper call. Um, right, brilliant. So is is it just yourself who would walk Rolo? Yeah, no, it's my missus as well. Perfect. So it's important then that to to ensure this service will work for you and benefit you, we get you and your partner's perspective on what Rolo's doing and the problems that Rolo's creating you out on his walks. Yeah. When can we do that? Uh, tomorrow. Perfect. Between one and two. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's do it. There you go. Amazing. So, I mean, another thing as well, like if, if you are, you know, if you can hear maybe the husband or the wife in the background or the spouse and they're, you know, speaking to them, maybe, Hey, could I just speak to your husband? Is, is that okay to do? I'm assuming. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah I, if you can get them settled on a call quickly, it's, yeah. it's yeah. nicer if you can do zoom or face to face, depending on how you do it. Yeah. Um, what you don't want to do is, is prolong this process between your initial call and then talking to the partner and then going on to another one. Yeah, got you. What notoriously will happen in that time is the partner will go on Google and go, well, who else is a dog trainer in this area? Yeah. And they'll start going, bum, 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 bum. Got you. So you want to keep that that initial follow-up process really tight. Yeah, got you. So, and, and that's another point. No, always set the next appointment, guys. Don't just like, yeah, call me back whenever. Set the next appointment, just like an appointment in the doctor's or a dentist. Get it in your diary. Um, another objection, pricing. Everyone does pricing. it. In Everybody talks talk pricing. Yeah. So talk to me about how I'm going to say to you, Jamie, you know, <sighs> gee, I, oh, God, five grand is a bit, it's a bit steep, mate. Um, I probably can't go ahead. Perfect. I agree with you. Five grand is a lot of money. But when we started this conversation out, you said that uh, you were looking to put 50 grand revenue a month on your figures. So you're not, you're not actually making a 5,000 pound decision. You're turning down 45,000 pounds. Great. So what, so what you did there was it was, was a value skew, right? It's actually stop looking at the cost, start looking at the return on investment. Absolutely. So that's one way um, you can go down the route of I am expensive. Uh, you know, and I absolutely agree with you. I am expensive. But the reason I'm expensive is because I get this result, this result, this result. And because I know that that's a question in your mind right now, at the end of this call, what I'm going to do is drop you over like the top three people that I've dealt with recently with their numbers or email addresses who you can reach out to discuss with them the results that they got through working with me. 
uh, you know, and obviously you've got to get permission from these people. Don't yeah. just so, give any so, free random addresses. But of course, it's like social proof, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. this is you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, who's uh, you know, oh, I've delivered train to three months ago, and they're booming now in their numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's another one. Uh, you can do the uh, you can do the cool off periods, I call it, or Grant Cardone calls it. So yeah, absolutely. You know, five thousand pounds a lot of money. I would need to think about it as well. I understand you want to take that little bit of time. What I'm going to do is at the end of this call, I'm going to send you that quote over so you've got it on paper. I'm just going to reiterate in that quote what we're actually doing for you, and I will give you a call tomorrow between ten and eleven. Ask any questions. I'm not going to ask you to buy tomorrow. I'm going to ask you to get any questions together you've got about that quotation and let's discuss it at that point from mm. there. And you're just giving them that little bit of call off period if they need it. And again, you'll, it depends on the feel of the customer. You know, yeah. different yeah. people say different horses, for different courses. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important to note as well, like sometimes you're going to get maybes in, in business, like customers who say maybe, and that's what you don't want in business. You'd, you'd rather have a no than a maybe, trust me, because yeah. you, you're in that kind of limbo stage. Are they going to buy? Are they going to buy? So something you know, we would do was actually just take the offer away and say, hey, you know what? It's not for you right now. We've got other people we need to speak to. Um, you know, you're more than happy to, you know, get in touch when this is a priority for you. And that's another thing, right? Qualifying priority or scale of one to 10, where you're on the priority factor. You know, a, a person who said five, uh, a police officer said five tours the other day. And I said, look, we're not going to be for you. Um, we want to work with people who, you know, eight plus, this is a priority yep. for and changing lives because business is hard. You've got to put in the work. You've got to learn. You've got to, you know, go through the ups and the downs. And if you're a five, you're just going to quit at the hurt first hurdle. And we want success right. stories. And I think by doing that, she thanked me and she said, you know, oh, I really appreciate that. And I really want to, you know, go forward with it when I've got these things out of the way. So don't be afraid to take away, you know, what you're offering, right? This isn't for you because that almost revertly, makes them want it more right so do you get that massively it's a um it's a, it's, it's never a complete no uh, mm. don't get me wrong there are complete no's but yeah a lot of the time it's not an actual complete no it's a it's not high on my agenda right now so i'm not ready to commit to it yeah uh yeah. and one of the ways i sometimes will again it depends on the the, the person and you know the quite stern face i probably wouldn't do this if they're quite relaxed i sort of say at the start of the call look if this isn't for you at the end of this call, that is absolutely 100% fine. But what I don't accept is maybes. I accept yeses and I accept noes. I don't accept maybes. So if it's a maybe, then just say it's a no for now. And, you know, th- there's no hard feelings on that. We can put you back in the diary for a couple months down the line, Correct. call you up again, and we can review where you're at at that stage. But that. let's talk through to see what your problems are right now. Uh, and nine times out of ten, most people go, actually talking to you because you know you want revenue you want to get into business you want yeah, yeah. you want to leave the police it's yeah, yeah. Just... and the thing is as well guys like you got to bear in mind the people who you're engaging with they've got the problems right whether you're you know selling dog training or you're selling you know uh, a new car or, or a second hand car they, they've got a problem going on that you can have a solution for so it's like well you haven't got the problem you've got the solution for their their pain so you know, you've got to have that dynamic when you're speaking to people, which I think is really key. Um, Jamie, where do you want to where do you want to go with building profits? What, what's kind of your vision for the future? Uh, I'd like to scale it, obviously. Um, ultimately, I would uh, like to mirror it to something of Grant Cardone's level. Um, mm-hmm. Not sure in the next two years I'll do that quite to his level. But you know, having that online portal, having a, a team behind me, uh, and delivering, you know, it, essentially, I look at it as. It's a skill set that I wasn't taught in school. I learned art parts of it in the police, but I learned most of it on the job out in sales. Yeah. Um, and it's a skill set actually for life that people, once you've got it, you've got it. Yeah. it. They'll obviously always change with the markets and the way technology goes, but the basics will always be there, the foundations, if you like. Uh, and so I want to impact on people's lives. I want people to be able to sell, uh, earn the money that they deserve to mm. earn. You know, that's that, that's that's my aim. I want to I want to scale up and grow. Do, do you think you know? Because I see. So the reason I you know shifts success in business, we have to you know in sell right. Yep. All of our clients, they have to sell their products or service. They're helping other people. They're helping their customers. And what I've noticed is that, uh, and you being an actual police officer, because I was a detention officer, but you know the the questioning process that you would do with a suspect or. Uh, potentially a victim as well 
um, is very similar to, you know, speaking sales. to a customer sales. Yeah. Because, you know, you're, you're trying to find out something, you're trying to discover what's going on and it's the same principle. Do you feel like, you know, you've, you've transferred almost a bit of skill set from being a police officer to your sales, you know, now your business. Massively, massively. So uh, you, you cold calling is knocking on doors in, yeah. as in the police, you know, for witnesses or whatever you're talking to people as your kind of your qualification. Um, you perhaps miss out the solution a little bit. Your solution is you get locked up, mate, I suppose yeah. to some degree, you don't yeah. have a choice. Um, but you know, then you'll enter into sometimes with more violent people or more uh, people who've got other health issues. You might enter into an art form of negotiation with those in order to uh, to, to get them into the back of a car, ultimately to custody or to wherever they've got to go. Mm. Uh, and then if you're on a, any kind of proactive kind of police officer, you're seeking out bad guys. And sales is about seeking out sales. It's it's a lot of it does convert over. Um, I think that's probably why I do well on new business more so than account management mm. in the sense that I spend a lot of time on response. It was all about seeking the bad guy, occasionally responding. Um, but it's all about, you know, find, locate and then work with. Amazing, amazing stuff. And I see and I'm glad you, you kind of uh, you agree with that. With regards to um, someone who's a bit nervous, someone obviously, you know, what the police is like, you know, what the culture is like someone who has maybe change if they're out of just a new family, they may be thinking of a new career, they don't like the toxicity in the police, they may feel like they're undervalued due to the pay freezes and the pension changes and all that kind of stuff that's going off. They like the idea of being an entrepreneur. They like the idea of going into business. They like the idea of living life on their terms. Yeah. But there's something that's just holding them back. Maybe it's the police is all they've ever known. For you, what advice would you give to that person? I, I understand it. I, and I probably felt it when I first came out. Uh, it's a security, but ultimately you get uh, you get one life to live and one shot to take at it. Uh, and you could go for thirty or forty years or whatever it'll be, you know, because the rules change like the wind, don't they? Now, <laughs> it's it's uh, you yeah. know you could go for that, and you might make it to the end and retire. But the amount of cops I then see that then go and get a job in order to top up their pension, you know. And, and this is no disrespect to them, guys. That's their choice. Some people might do it for their own sanity, yeah. you know, or whatever. The amount of people I see then go work again when really you've just spent 30 years battering your body, battering your mind, battering your soul in order to get to this magical retirement to then go back out and, and do it anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say take the opportunity, take the chance, jump. Um, it's not as scary as you think on the other side. Mm. Uh, and this is from somebody who came and, and like had no job for 24 hours and was in panic mode yeah. uh, of like, shit, yeah. when we're going to yeah. pay the bills. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I'll be honest, I, I've been at the bottom of jobs and I've mm. been at the top of jobs as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Um, and you, you just need to take the opportunity. If it's there and you want it, jump at it because it might not be there next year when you think yeah. about doing it, you yeah. know. Uh, but that's the big thing is you might go, this is a brilliant idea. I'm going to do it in 12 months. In 12 months time, that market could be so saturated that mm. actually that jump now doesn't give you the income that you want. Yeah. Yeah. Completely get it. So the op always, always op time is opportunity, right? Is it you've got yeah. a, an opportunity cost, which equals time. Um, with regards to, um, you know, your kind of uh, yourself, what kind of advice would you give to yourself now where you are? You've got a great business. You've got this amazing skill set what advice would you give to that person who has just left the police and they've got no job they've got a young family what advice would you give to that person i would say believe in yourself work hard learn as quick as you can mm. uh, learn a skill set uh, such as sales you know mm. or whether you know sales is one skill set if you're going to learn a trade learn it quick mm. you know if you're going to be a plumber electrician go and do it hit it hard and it will be okay at the other end of the tunnel there is a light yeah. it might not seem like it on that day uh, yeah. or even that year yeah but it will come and when yeah. that light hits you 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 know you'll you'll be thankful uh, and i'll tell you a very quick story alex and this yeah. i'll keep this one very short but so i was sacked obviously from staff police about 18 months later one of my close friends and sergeants who was sergeant from day dot i joined like yeah. you know a mentor almost she died of cancer uh, yeah. so i go to this funeral and obviously all the senior team and staff police are there. Uh, I was invited, 
because I just know for a very, very long time. Yeah. And I walked up to the ACC who sacked me after leaving. Oh, sorry, sacked me. Walked up to the ACC and thanked him for letting me go. Uh, and I said to him, I was very honest, I said, on the day you sacked me, I thought you were the biggest on the planet. Yeah. And I hated every bone in your body. Uh, and, you know, I sit here today and say, I'm actually really thankful that you did it because it creates a life outside of the police for me that I didn't know I had. Mm. And that's the funny thing, you know, you've probably heard this. You've, it's amazing hearing that, you know, when everything feels like it's falling apart, such as what you went through, actually things are just falling into place. Yeah. And it's hindsight, that 2020 vision, looking back, thinking actually it happened because of this. And, yeah. you know, looking now, you've got more time with your family, you know, you're doing bigger, you've been earning a lot more. Um, there's no more shift work. Um, and sometimes it needs that reflective period um especially through. when yeah exactly exactly um and also i will say you know i've again i've mentioned this in our group the other day jamie but i've not met one person who's burnt their boats meaning that they've made a decision to change some area of their life and not made it work i just I per personally i've not I'm, myself included I've, many members we have at shift success who have done it uh, people out there in the general public who have made that career change i've just personally not saw someone who've made a decision to change something and then not make it work and you know i think people get in their fear of oh what if it doesn't work out and you've got to flip it and say well what if it does Absolutely. If, it, if it doesn't you're going to end up in exactly the same place you're in now right um jamie one of the last questions that i like to ask every single guest and this show's been absolutely amazing but what does entrepreneurship mean to you originally when i jumped into it as money i'll be honest it was money motivated um, but now I've, now I've worked with people, I've started to understand people. It's about impacting lives. It's about changing people's lives for me. I, I enjoy the fact that I can walk for, away from that PT, for example, knowing that he's changed his life. He's left his day job. He's got a business that he really wanted to do. It's succeeding. It, it's changing people's lives and, and, and impacting on them, giving them a greater, uh, you know, I'm not a glowing future. I'm not a godlike creature. <laughs> uh, but certainly, you know, when, when I leave, I, I, I want to be in a place where that business has succeeded and I've had an input into that succession. Ultimately, I don't do the phone calls for them. Mm -hmm. I train them in how to, to handle things and how to deal with things and how to grow. Um, but it's something that I, I've learned and now, you know, I'm passing on. And it's, it's almost like a, you know, it's interesting the amount of people you meet who go, oh, yeah, I've had a business for years, but I don't know how to sell. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then you put yeah. a process in place, and suddenly they're booming overnight like that. It's it's, it's, it's funny because you know, you, you driving instructor, you go you go to a driving instructor, right, to learn the yeah, skill, yeah. to become a police officer, you go to training school, to learn how to read and write, you go to your parents or your siblings. Same thing with sales and business, right? You have to develop that skill set. Jamie, lastly, where can people get in touch? Where can people find out about you? Uh, so you can reach out at jamie at buildingprofits.co.uk. Uh, the website's currently under construction, so there's no website currently at the minute. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Jamie Sargent, Instagram, uh, it's under Building Profits UK. Uh, on Facebook, you can find me Jamie Sargent, or there is a Building Profits uh, UK sales page as well. Uh, or you can reach out on mobile, you know, I'm quite happy for anybody to ring me, uh, which is 07 506 027 642. And reach yeah. out, let's have a discussion. Do you know how many listen listeners we have for the podcast, Jamie? <laughs> <laughs> Your phone's going to go wild. Um, Jamie, <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, absolutely amazing. First of all, I want to say how amazingly honest and transparent you've been about your story. Um, it's an absolute pleasure that you're part of the family of Shift Success. And every time you share your wins and how you're building your business and the changes you're making in your customer's life is a phenomenal domino effect. And it really sincerely uh, means a lot to me. And I just want to say that we're proud of you at Shift Success. And I cannot wait to see your business fly uh, over the next 12 months. And what I'd love to do is get you on the show again in the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's do it. And thanks for having me. No problem at all. Jamie, thank you so much for your time. Guys, I hope you got some value from this. It will be uploaded to the podcast soon. And yeah, if you've got any questions for me or Jamie, please do get in touch. And I'll be seeing you on the next episode. Cheers.